From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Dave Borger, Johnny. Marine and Maritime Casualty. Hiya, Dave. Awful. I'm in mourning, Johnny, for Molly Kay. Oh, sorry, Dave. You have my sympathy. Save it. This is money, not sentiment. We had her insured for a cool half million. You mean dames come that high these days? No, but a rusty old tub of a freighter does. What happened? She steamed out of San Francisco Bay, bound for Yokohama. Twenty miles off the Golden Gate, she upended and departed this world forever. Real sudden, huh? Too sudden. I don't like sudden things. Why don't you fly out there, Johnny? Take a look at the remains. Sure. As long as you're willing to pay for it. You're hired, but be careful. Don't get yourself killed. While I'm on an expense account? Dave, you've got a lot to learn. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Marine and Maritime Casualty Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during the investigation of the Molly K matter. Item 1, $164.50, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to San Francisco. It was mid-morning when I landed, and the city on the seven hills glittered under the bright sun like a fabulous hoard of jewels. A cool, crisp breeze was driving the usual night's bank of fog out toward the open sea, and the clear waters of the bay danced and sparkled from the touch of the wind. It was a day and a place that felt lusty with life and the joy of living. And yet 36 hours before, the freighter Molly Kay, with a crew of 43 men, had steamed out across this same bay, passed under the high arch of the Golden Gate Bridge, and disappeared into the gray oblivion of the Pacific, gone down to her death. Item two, $1.55, local transportation. Limousine to my hotel, where I barely had time to check in, then a taxi down to the foot of Market Street, where Harbor Master Tim O'Rourke, a grizzled old veteran of the port, was about to preside at a preliminary board of inquiry in the ferry building. All right, boys, all right, let's have it quiet. Now, all of us know what we're here for, but just to make it official, I have to announce that this is the preliminary hearing of a board of inquiry investigating the loss by sinking of the vessel Molly Kay. Needless to say, for you that know me, the proceedings are going to be pretty informal. Yeah, you can be sure of that. All right. Now, the bare facts seem to be go something like this. The Molly Kay cleared her berth at Pier 29 at 10, 12 p.m. night before last. Destination, Yokohama. Primary cargo, grain. The Molly Kay was a steel hull Class C freighter. Oil-fueled, with a steam turbine drive. She was under the command of her owner, Captain Edgar Brawley of San Francisco. Now, is, uh, is Captain Brawley present? I am, but if you're expecting me to tell... Well, myself... later, Captain, later. All right. At 10.38, the Molly K dropped her pilot and proceeded on out to sea. Fog conditions were reported at the time as medium to dense. Then at 12.49 a.m., the radio operator on duty at the point beneath a Coast Guard station picked up the first distress signal. Now I'll call the first witness, the officer in charge of the rescue operation, Lieutenant Commander Barton Fields of the United States Coast Guard. Will you take the witness chair, Commander? I'll raise your right hand, Commander. Do you swear the testimony the you were about to give moved along, is the whole truth? But not much came out that wasn't already known. The Coast Guard right. commander testified that five I'm minutes after the first distress call, the Molly K had sent a second SOS, stating she was sinking rapidly by the bow. According to the message, the vessel had struck a submerged derelict. The captain and crew had taken to the lifeboats, and two of these were picked up immediately. A third boat, missed in the heavy fog, made shore and beached under its own efforts. Now... According to this report, two men, William Mack, machinist, and Benny Wong, steward, are still missing. Now, further search has now been abandoned, and these men are presumed to be dead. I think that's all, Commander. Thank you. Now, will radio operator G.A. Beck take the witness chair? 
While the testimony went on, I studied the teletypes from the home office that I'd picked up at the hotel. Again, nothing much that wasn't already known, with a few exceptions. A stray fact or two, a couple of odd details, nothing else. But the seeds of suspicion are pretty small. And if they're kept well watered, sometimes they grow up into nice, tall, blooming hunch plants. <laughs> then Chairman O'Rourke called the witness I was most interested in. Will Captain Edgar Brawley please take the chair? <laughs> The man who stood to collect a half million dollars if the sinking was legitimate. But I was pretty sure it wasn't. Raise your right hand, Captain. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. You can sit down. He was a man about 50, maybe older. But he had the body of a young bull. Hard, stubborn, belligerent. He figured to be a tough lad to tangle with in court or on the deck of a ship. Now, Captain, will you tell us what happened in your own words? Starting where? From the time you dropped the pilot. Uh, unless something happened earlier that might have some bearing on this case. There wasn't nothing that happened earlier or later that got any bearing on it. We hit a submerged derelict, that's all. Now, what more do you want to know? Your story, Captain. Just for the record. Be no different from what you've already heard from all the rest of them here. This is an official board of inquiry, Captain, whether you like it or not. I'll be the judge of what's important and what isn't. Yes, sir. Well, after we dropped the pilot, I set a course north 77 west, aimed to bring us into the main shipping lane by daybreak. Then I assigned the watches, had the deck gear stowed away, opened the trip log, got ready to settle down for the night's run. Normal procedure, in other words. That's what I told you. There was nothing that was... Go on with your story, Captain. My first officer took over the bridge, like he already told you he did, and I went to my quarters. What was the weather like at the time? Same as it had been all evening. So foggy you couldn't see a hundred feet from the bridge. (laughs) And you took all the usual precautions prescribed for such a condition? Of course. Go on. Well, it was a while before midnight was still in my quarters, awake in my bunk when she hit. It was a big crash, like a torpedo had took us, and the lights went out. We started losing the headway, and a couple of minutes later, the engineer cut the engines and pulled his fires. Water had busted right through number one and number two bulkheads and was rising fast in the boiler room. Must have ripped half the bottom out of her. What did you do next? I called the engine room gang on deck, and... Well, then I... I give the order to abandon ship. He sank less than ten minutes after we got the boats on. Well, I, I guess that's about the size of it. <clears throat> Submerged derelict in the shipping lane. It was an accident, pure and simple. All right, Captain. I guess there's nothing Mr. more Chairman. we can... Mr. Dollar? I wonder if I could have your permission to ask the captain a few questions. Well... It's kind of unusual, but like I said, this is an informal hearing, so, um... Captain Brawley, Mr. Dollar is a special investigator for the insurance company that holds the policy on your ship. His position here is unofficial, of course, and you're under no obligation. It's up to you. Well, I've told you all I know about it. I got nothing to hide if that's what you're talking about. Not one single thing I... All right. Let him ask till he's blue in the face. Go ahead, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Captain Brawley, we've heard quite a lot about your last sailing for Yokohama night before last. But there hasn't been any mention of the first time you started to leave, a little over a week ago. Had no bearing on this. Maybe not, but let's talk about it anyway. According to my report, you were six hours out of San Francisco when you radioed the Coast Guard to stand by. You had a cargo fire in number two hole. That's right. A little while later, you told them you had the fire under control, but you were returning to port. I wanted to check the damage, make sure the ship was sound. Yeah. So you laid up in harbor for a week. You filed a claim with our home office in Hartford for estimated damages of $6,300. Come no more. But when the company appraiser called at your office on Pier 29, you refused him admittance to the ship, and an hour later, you wired Hartford and canceled your claim. That's right. A $6,300 loss, fully covered by insurance, and you suddenly decided not to make any claim for it? I'd have lost more if I had claimed it. How do you figure that? Because I had found out that I'd have to lay up here for another two weeks while that sneaking company of yours checked the facts, as they called it. I had a cargo on board. I had a delivery date ahead of me. Couldn't afford to waste two weeks. What caused the fire? I don't know. 
Who, uh, who found it and reported it? A uh, man named Bill Mack. All right, all right. He was one of the two men that drowned when the ship went down. What of it? What are you trying to make out of it? All right, let's quiet down now. Let's have order in here. Now, at the time of the accident, Captain, the sinking, we're led to believe that it was a little foggy out that night. You doubt it? No, not in the least. That's why I can't quite understand how you managed to see that, uh, that submerged derelict. I didn't see it. Then who did? Nobody, as far as I know. That fog, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. There was no fog the next day. The Coast Guard searched the area for hours, and they didn't see it either. Well, it probably sunk when we hit it. it. Just what are you getting at, Dollar? How do you know there was any submerged derelict, Captain? What do you mean? You said there was a big crash. All the crew members described the accident as a sudden hard shock. In fact, one of them, Mr. Hawkins there, who was up for it on bow lookout, said it felt like a blast, like something... Oh, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. Uh, Mr. Hawkins. I didn't say it was no blast. What I said was it just kind of felt like one. You ain't gonna go putting no words like that in my mouth, Mr. Dollar. You ain't gonna get me mixed up in this. Mixed up in what, Mr. Hawkins? In this here, whatever's going on, or whatever you're trying to claim is going on. I just don't know nothing about it, about anything. And I I just don't want anybody putting words in my mouth, that's all. Claiming I said something I didn't. I, I, well... Just what exactly is it you're hitting at, Mr. Dollar? Not hitting, Captain, I'm saying it. I don't think there was a derelict. I think the Molly Kay was sunk by an explosive charge placed in a hole. Are you accusing me of that? I'm not accusing anybody, not yet. All right, all right, now let's settle Are down. Are you going to sink my own ship just to collect a few lousy bucks worth of insurance? I don't know who did it, Captain Brawley, but I'm going to find out. And whoever it was, they're in it up to their neck. Two men died when the Molly Kay went down, so this thing's a whole lot worse than just a crooked insurance racket. It's a case of cold-blooded murder. <laughs> Outside, after the hearing adjourned, I turned west and walked along the Embarcadero. I looked at the crowds and the sunshine and the seagulls out over the bay. It was all brisk and bright and cheerful. But I felt cold in the pit of my stomach. They were scared in there, all of them, scared to death. The smell of fear in that hearing room was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And I meant to find out why. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this story. Thanks. Tomorrow night, a strange girl and a strange threat. And a promise that's stranger than both. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.